I don't like stages. <laughs> So how are you all this morning? You good? So what I'm most excited about today is that I actually uh, chose to come here. Let me tell you about that. You know, people who do work and who are professional in the area of uh, international development get invited to speak in different places and they don't always make such good choices. Sometimes you go somewhere and you speak and it's not the right place to be. But I found out very quickly when I looked at some of the materials online and the materials that uh, Dan had sent me that this was the only place to be. And I was very excited about it. <clears throat> so, you know, sometimes when you go to speak, uh, you have to drive yourself or take a train or fly, right? Just, I'm just coming back from California. I came home around one o'clock in the morning and then this morning I had the great fortune of being picked up at seven o'clock this morning in New Jersey. Yes, I live in New Jersey. <laughs> and Dan and his wife Anna picked me up early this morning and drove me here, which I might have otherwise I might have just driven myself a meeting a friend who lives a few minutes from here, but the best part of my day is gonna turn out to be this drive. And the reason for that is because I really found out about what you're doing here. It wasn't really online, and it wasn't in the materials. It was really from Dan and Anna telling me about their life in this organization, okay? Your organization is very special. You're looking at all the materials, you look at the brochure, you look at your website. That's not the story. The story is what you tell us. It's what you experience. And so for the hour and a half that I was in the car, I asked them a lot of questions, and we engaged in a discussion about a lot of topics. And what was really wonderful was at the end of it, I felt like I made the right choice to be here because I'm gonna get to learn more and it's gonna help me in my work. So everything I do is about being open to learning. And that's why you are here this week, right? You're here to learn about the world. So let me just tell you a little bit about how I came to do the work I do. I'm a teacher and I'm a pediatrician. Anyone know what a pediatrician is? Is that the person who sticks you in the arm 50 million times <laughs> in your lifetime? So for 31 years, I've been a doctor and I've taken care of children. And somewhere along the line, while I was taking care of American children, I discovered children around the world. I started traveling and first I took care of lots of children who were adopted. Did you know that thousands of children get adopted from different countries all over the world into families in Ireland, France, Germany, United States, Canada? and those children have the benefit of a permanent home after they lost their family. But as I became more involved with helping families to adopt children who needed families, I realized that there were millions of orphans all over the world who will never have a permanent family. In fact, the data from UNICEF is 153 million orphans that's a tiny amount compared to what the real story is. There are 2.2 billion children in the world and likely half of those children live in poverty. And at some point in their lives, they're orphaned, either lost both parents or one, and have no food, shelter, education, or access to medical care. And what I believe is that <clears throat> my destiny was to help take care of those children. Now some people would say that seems to be a big task. I don't wanna get involved with that. That's too big for me. Dan was asking me like, how do you decide what to do? And sometimes when te someone tells you that you have a really big task, you might say, that's too big for me. And you might walk away. I believe that the bigger 
the problem you tell me about, the more I want to do something about it. Make it really big, and I'll do it. I don't run away from big things, and I want to share with you why. Because you can make a difference. Even if the problem is ridiculously big, all you need to do is do something tiny. And what you're doing here this week is learning about how to do something tiny. Because that little something that you do out in the world will make a difference. So don't ever let any big problem make you uncomfortable. So that could go for everyday life. Someone could tell you that you have to read a book in a week and the book is 300 pages and you might get nauseous and want to race to the barf. But there's nothing you can't do. You just have to break it up into pieces and you have to have a different perspective. Now, what I learned today from Dan and Anna was a lot about this organization's beginnings. I learned about Pastor Park, his daughter. I learned about the mission and vision of the organization. And this organization that you are part of now has a huge vision, a tiny mission, a tiny mission to make a change in the world, but a huge vision is about how to do that. And so there's thousands of you. You're here one week, but there's camps all over the world. And each one of those camps is pretty much doing the same thing that you're doing. And actually, we have a lot in common. Let me tell you what we have in common. Dan told me that Pastor Park has been very focused on people's sadness and depression. That he discovered a long time ago that many youth were lonely and isolated and didn't have connection to one another. And many of them ended up taking their own lives. Do you all know about that? It's pretty horrible, pretty tragic, a big problem, huge. And even though I'm used to huge problems and I'm used to hearing sad things, I was very sad this morning in the car. No child should ever be sad or afraid or fearful. And no child should ever feel so low and so blue that they wouldn't want to live. So you're part of an amazing mission and vision here in this organization. And that's exactly the same for us. Worldwide Orphans is about helping orphans feel good about their lives. Let me tell you a little bit about what the life of an orphan is. I want everyone to close their eyes. No cheating. He's doing a good job. Come on. Everybody close your eyes and just rest for a second. <laughs> Was that hard to do? Come on. I'll close my eyes with you. Are you all ready? Okay. Imagine a little baby lying in a little metal crib all by himself. His diaper is wet. He's hungry. His belly feels very empty. No one is touching him. Someone comes along and rolls up a little towel and puts it under his head and takes a bottle and snips the nipple and then lies the bottle on the towel and pushes it in his face. No one's holding him. No one's talking to him. And suddenly the bottle falls away and he's hungry and empty and he can't get at it because he's only two months old. And then what ends up happening is the bottle doesn't get back in his mouth and he spends many hours lying wet, hungry, and needing the touch of another human being. That's the life of an orphan. Open your eyes. 
I don't think I can still even now, myself, having seen children live like that, even grasp how that feels. Then the child grows up in an orphanage, playing with other children to some extent, but not having access to education, no access to medical care, having many infections, maybe even growing up with HIV, being hospitalized, and not having the love and touch of adults and then that child has to sort of deal with going out into the real world without any instruction for life skills. Kids like that end up in the street. They end up involved with criminality. They're depressed. And they have nobody to help guide them. And that's the work that you're all engaged in indirectly. Your world is the world outside of you. It's the global world. And that's what my organization does. We reach children so that they are fed by somebody. We reach children so they can play, so they can dance. What a beautiful way for me to start out with you today, to see you dancing. And then what happened? Did I know that you were going to be dancing this morning? I really had no idea you were going to be dancing. I should have known. But then I show you a film, and what, it, what was in the film? Dancing. It's what we believe is at the heart of what makes people happy, is singing, dancing, acting, painting, drawing, writing. If I go a day without writing, I'm miserable. I have to write my blog because I need to be in touch with how I feel so I can do good work. So the heart of good work in the world is about your expression of your feelings and thoughts and your sharing of those feelings and thoughts with someone else. And that can be played out in sport or in art. Any kind of sport, any kind of art brings people together physically. You're gonna do a 5K? that's gonna make you feel fantastic. You're gonna feel accomplished. I don't think the girls should have a shorter pathway. <laughs> I think that's discrimination. I, I think the girls should run longer and harder. <laughs> <laughs> Very old-fashioned. Anyway, so I'm not going to talk much longer. I'm going to just say a couple of other things. I'm crazy in love with the mission here, and I have absolutely nothing in common with Pastor Park. This is a Korean man who's 71 years old. He's older than me, which I like. I like to meet anyone who's older than me. And he's Korean and he's Christian. I'm a nice Jewish girl from Long Island. And he probably has the same thoughts and ideas that I have, but we're so different, right? That in it itself is the message I want to drive home to you. We need to be about what we find similar with one another and yet to appreciate what's so different about each of us. I mean, that's really in my, that's my reason to be alive, is to discover how more open I can be to things I might not like, to be more re receptive to things I might fear. I want to meet people always who come from a very different world, than me, so that they can teach me to be better. I want to be more good. I want to be better. And the only way to do that is for someone to challenge me, to show me that there are other ways to do things. Now, it sounds lovely and lofty. It's the hardest thing for humans 
to listen. We don't get along well with one another. Divorce in Korea actually is 70%. Same in Quebec, by the way. We even have divorce mediators working for the government in Montreal because there's so much divorce and they're concerned about making sure that the children are cared for properly. So they have them working for the government. So we know that the human spirit is powerful and good and strong, and yet we're constantly challenged by how intolerant humans are of one another. It's just crazy. It's so frustrating. Now, conflict is very important. It's great to have disagreements. It's wonderful to be in conflict. It's good to argue. It's good to spar and differ and work it out at the end. So I'm not saying that we all have to get along and smile, okay? That can't be. We're unique individuals with different points of view and we're passionate about those points of view. But we need to work hard to find solutions to the world's problems. So my last comment to you, and then we'll have lots of time for questions, is that we really need to be very aware of the needs of our planet. The planet Earth has need for us to be tolerant. The planet Earth needs for us to be loving. And the planet Earth needs for us to solve a lot of important problems that are both human and not human. We need to take care of animals, plants, mountains, polar ice caps. We have a big job as human beings on this planet Earth. It's our responsibility to take care of ourselves as individuals. I'm gonna talk about that for one second. Your self-care is key to the solution for the planet Earth. The more you care about yourself and take good care of yourself physically and emotionally, that fits you for the great task to take care of the planet Earth and whatever piece of that planet Earth that you're invo involved in. But without self-care, without loving yourself and feeling hopeful and joining with others, you can't take care of the world. And we alluded to it before when I talked about the sadness and depression of youth around the world and how important it is for us to address that issue because without helping people come out of isolation and sadness, we can't take care of our planet. We need to work together, but we first need to take care of ourselves as individuals. So your being here this week is an important commitment to your self-care. My being here today was about my commitment to myself. I came here to feel your commitment, to feel your self-care and your desire to care for the world. I came here to be fueled like, you know, like a superhero who loses their strength with hard work. I have to come out and join with organizations like your own and yourselves as individuals to be refueled, to be reminded of how wonderful it is that people care about one another. My final little piece of this uh, talk I'm giving to you is really about tolerance. One of the things, the great challenges we have in the world is that we have that war. And a lot of the war we end up in is really about not having the ability to tolerate differences. 
And unless we tolerate differences, no matter how hard that may be for you, we will never be at peace. Peace is about difference. And I stand before you very different than many of you. And you look around the room, you're different from the people standing or sitting around you. And with different viewpoints and a different facial appearance and different color of skin and different, different backgrounds. But the only way to make it all work is for us to join together and be tolerant and open. Okay, so I'm done with the preaching. <laughs> now I'm gonna take lots of questions, okay? Yes, you, Yankee. Biggest challenge I ever faced in my career. I faced lots of challenges in my career, and I'm constantly fighting. So that's a great question. I'm hopping up and down, screaming and yelling sometimes behind my garage. <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with not being able to move the agenda. There's a tremendous amount of hard work you have to do when you do global work. Different cultures, different ideas, things move slowly. I'm patient, but passionate. So I'm constantly facing this challenge to be able to manage very difficult situations and decisions, okay, but still keep sane, still keep, you know, civil, remain civil and sane, and also to be able to continue on the path to have the same passion, even though I didn't get what I wanted at that minute. So that's very much a part of global work, and it's an everyday situation. Uh, but more to the point, I just want to answer that in another way. And that is that the greatest challenge I face in my work really has to do about money. Finally, at the end of the day, raising money to be able to support work is really hard. Sometimes feel like I'm a car salesperson, you know? And you have to get accustomed to asking and never feeling ashamed because when you know your cause is good, there's no shame in asking for help. So money, raising money, that I wanted to give you a practical answer. I gave you the philosophical piece about keeping hope, but the other piece is real, that raising money is hard and hard in these days. And you just have to stick to it, never give up. I don't ever give up. And I, in fact, enjoy it now. And I enjoy very much going out and asking people for help because I know that my work is good. And I also am not mad at anyone who says, no, I can't give. So, okay, so you'll give to something else. My hope is that if I ask and don't get, that someone else comes along and asks and they will get. Because each of us has the right and it's very important to choose something to give to that you believe in. Is that good? You're welcome. <laughs> Next, who's got another question? Yes. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, throughout your global work, how you prioritize your day? How do I prioritize my day? day? Yeah. That's a great one. What kind of hat is that? Whole Foods? Yeah, I work at Whole Foods in Miami, yeah. Oh, wow. That's a good team to be on, right? <laughs> Nothing like healthy food. Okay, that's a fantastic question. Uh, the prioritizing the day has to do with number one, self-care, which I alluded to. Number one thing you need to do is what do I need to take care of myself that day? Did I get a good night's sleep? Did I get a snack to start my day? Did I plan my day so I'm not gonna be dropping dead at the end of the day? Now ask me how good I am at this. I stink. Really, this is a hard part of my life, is figuring out how to prioritize. That big P, not only obviously personally, but then for the organization that you work in, if you can't prioritize your tasks, you then 
can't move your agenda ahead. So the big P, priorities, is both professionally and personally very important. And it's just now that I'm really becoming more aware of personal priorities. I've been a person of service all my life. That was my destiny as I grew up, that I would serve and I became a doctor and an international aid worker. And my whole goal in life was to be of service. That was my priority. But along the way, I forgot to take care of myself. And, you know, I still look pretty good considering, but <laughs> I, don't, I often feel too tired. Like, you know, last night I came in from LA and I worked really hard all day and I didn't get to sleep till one. And then I didn't sleep well last night because I had things on my mind. So when you sleep, you need to sleep well. And then I got up too early. You know, that kind of thing is really important. So I'm really going to stress that's a gorgeous question and one that if you're asking now at your young age is going to really be important to you. Ariana Huffington, Huffington Post, she laughs sometimes when she has lunch with very powerful professionals. And whenever somebody brags that they only sleep two or three hours a night, she says, I'm not doing business with you. You're not the kind of person I, who I want to work with because people who don't sleep aren't healthy. They're not strong. They're not taking care of themselves. That's nothing to brag about. So I want to drive that home for you. You need to sleep well. You need to take care of yourself. And that's a priority for your organization as well as for yourself. Yes, you have a question? Not sure. Um, how do you take that away from like not crying every time you see something that's so? Oh, sad. I love that question. You're beautiful. What's your name? Samora. Samora. Yes. Yeah. I'm just like you. I was crying. I cried like I'm, every day. Walk through the door. I'm crying. I was sitting there watching the dances. I'm crying. What's more beautiful than you know a host of Asian faces being African? <laughs> So the, the answer is simple. You're ready. You take your emotions with you. They're an important part of the package. You have to be emotional to do this work. You have to be passionate and emotional, and you have to watch your feelings. And you have to use them to be strong. But emotions are beautiful. And don't forget that. You're set. You're ready to go. Go, girl. Yes. She's, I'm going to help her. Go ahead. Yeah, I got the mic. Got to run faster, Dan. <laughs> I was wondering, since you said that you were born to serve, I was wondering if there's ever a point where you found that you couldn't, you couldn't, you weren't able to do what you wanted to do. Like, you had that certain hurdle which you couldn't cross. Frustration. Oh. The frustration you're talking about, about not being able to do what you to do? Yeah, how do you overcome that? You don't overcome it. It's a part of thing in life. You're going to feel as if you can't do what you want to do. Is that, a, is that a sort of a shocking thing to say? You will always feel that you can't do what you want to do. There's no free pass in the world. There's always a struggle for everything. Nothing comes easy. Even if you look around and think that people are doing life easier than you, it's not real. Even people who appear to have a lot of money and entitlement and all the rest, they're struggling too with things that you don't even imagine. So I don't want you to get the feeling that Life is just a series of frustrations, but you train yourself to believe and have faith. This is where your Christian faith is so powerful. If you are a person with faith, then you have faith in yourself. 
and then it doesn't matter how frustrating things are because you believe in yourself and the ability to make things happen. And that's how I've lived all my life. And believe me, I live with a lot of frustration. And there are many moments where I feel like I'm not going to be able to do what I want to do. Every time I talk about my foundation and that I want more money and want to do more things, I'm excited about it and I feel passionate, but at the same time, I had the little voices in my head. Will I be able to raise that money? Will I be able to do what I believe? But that's the balance. And the power comes from your faith in yourself. Does that make sense? You have to believe in yourself. Question, yes. Um, despite all those struggles, how did you find your motivation and what is your current motivation? I have a lot of energy. She's asking about my motivation. This is a really good question because I'm not going to give you the answer that, you know, seems pat. I myself as an individual am very driven and I have a huge amount of energy. I was lucky to be born with drive. I physically have a lot of energy. I don't look my age, I don't act my age, I just am filled with the feeling that I can do anything and it's pretty much all the time. It's kind of annoying to people. What? Yeah, it's just part of who I am. And sometimes because I feel that way so much, other people hitch on to the, you know, to me and then they can feel that too. And that's what your camp is about. Your camp is about creating energy. So, because many of you are not driven and don't have a high energy, but you'll be working in your groups and you'll be part of an organization that takes you and helps you to have more energy because there's power in a group. So even if you might not be as zesty and fiery as, as your neighbor, you can catch that spirit and join, and then you can operate in the best context for you. You do your job, or you choose things that fit your level of energy. But for me, I'm wild. I'm just wild, like I'm like a hyperactive kid. And so that's where, you know, that's where my strength comes from. But you have to find your strength so that you do what's best for yourself. Yep, let me get on the other end. Okay, first you. Do you want to use my mic? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for t uh, taking my question. Thank God that I have an opportunity to ask a celebrity like you. Just tell us how does the, your normal working day look like? Normal working day. Sort of Thank like you. what... Uh, the Whole Foods maniac asked me about. <laughs> Such a nice smile. The, the normal day for me is very up early in the morning. I'm a morning person. So I'm up at 6 and I do a lot of email. I try to catch up on my correspondence. I make a list, actually a written list of what I need to deal with. Uh, and, uh, and then I look at my schedule for the day and see how that fits in with my written list of communication. Because for me, correspondence is the most important thing I do. Writing back to people in a timely fashion is key to my success. I love to email people and let them know that I've seen their email and that I'm going to be in touch with them and figure out how to be in touch in the future if it's not that day. And then I look at that schedule and I see if the schedule is, is right. The schedule sometimes is wrong. So one of the most important things I do in my day is to correct the schedule because people sometimes make a schedule for me that doesn't work. So that's really key. So I might rearrange my schedule and I'll do that with my assistant. And then, you know, the rest of my day consists of really a, a nice mixture of in-person meetings, phone meetings, and also writing and reading. I do a lot of reading 
And I'm not saying that I'm reading novels, newspapers, and nonfiction. I'm actually, you know, reading things online and reading documents and proposals that are given to me from the office because I've, we've applied for grants or there are action items that I have to take care of, so that becomes part of my priority list. And then, you know, I have a real important priority in my life is that I have two teenage sons. They're 13 and 15. And so their schedule in the day is amazingly important for me. So if I need to drop one off in the bus in the morning, that's key to the day. If I need to pick them up or take them to sports or different activities, that's gonna be a key part of the end of the day. And of course in the summer, that's really busy because kids go to camp and do all kinds of activities. So my children are very much a part of my priority and my daily life. Um, Skyping is important to me. When I was sitting with Anna, Dan's wife, I was making sure that I got my back invitation from someone who I invited to Skype with me for tonight, and I also realized that I needed to change that appointment till 10 o'clock from 9 o'clock. But I wanted to make sure, and I was happy. I, then I called. I do a lot of calling. During my day, I speak on the phone a lot. A lot. I don't leave any conflicting or emotional activities for email or texting. I call people. If someone's upset, someone has some feelings, I use the phone. I don't use email to say anything, really, ever anything that can be misinterpreted. I'm very careful about the tone in my emails. I use email for a really straight, direct communication and then my day is filled with phone conversations. And then the end of the day is cooking dinner. I like to cook dinner sometimes, and then do homework with my kids, watch TV with my children. I love to watch Phineas and Ferb. I don't like SpongeBob anymore, I've had it. And movies, sometimes my kids will select movies that they like, and then we can sit and enjoy the movie together because that's part of who they are and what they need, and I like to know what they're thinking about because they're not gonna tell me what they're thinking about because they're teenagers. <laughs> okay, yes. This one good? Hi, Hi. Uh, my Hi. name is Jesse. Uh, first, I wanted to say that really, I really like really appreciate what you're doing. Um, ever since I was little, I've always wanted to kind of do something similar to what you're doing and helping like orphans around the world. Um, at my elementary school, I had a lot of kids that didn't have parents, and at a young age, I was surrounded by that. And I would always look at myself and then look at the other kids and was grateful the fact that I did have parents. And I know that. Being a teenager, like we do go through a lot of things, but then I always think about kids that have to wake up like alone and hungry and afraid and not knowing what the, what's, what's gonna happen next. So I really appreciate what you're doing. I really look up to that. Um, I have two tiny questions. Um, the first question is, how exactly did you start um, your organization really? Mm -hmm. Like did you just wake up one day and just thought of like, hey, I should try this? Or like, how did that really start? Okay, so that's a really very interesting question, which could have a very long answer, but I'm gonna be very clear and simple with you, and that is that I'm a person who believes in destiny. And I had a destiny to be a doctor since I was very little, three years old, because I had a, an uncle who worked with Native Americans and Africans in the area of tuberculosis, so I've lived my life with a destiny. That's really been helpful to me. It guides me because I know, I knew early on that I would be about service, I knew that I would do it through medicine, and I knew that my path actually would be laid out for me if I left myself open for experiences with people. And I enjoy being with people. So for me, the way in which I ended up in the work I'm in is just, it kind of just fell into place because I, I like so many things. 
I'm very eager to be connected and intimate with people. I like being close to people. And that need for closeness is really about global work. The key in the work of this organization, your organization, is the same for me. It's about needing to be close to others, to not live like silos. So my work just took on, it just had a, it rolled out for me. You know, I was a teacher for 10 years, then I became a pediatrician, and then as my training was during the era of AIDS, I became engaged in the care of children and adults with HIV, then that extended to my work abroad. Everything connected up nicely, and I followed my destiny. And that's not just, I'm not just saying that and making it sort of simple. I really allowed, I was available to my destiny, like I was available to my patients when they were sick and people called me. I was there. I was in the moment. And I'm in the moment here now. And it was my destiny to be here with you today. And that's really how I live. Not everybody can live like that. People need to be more controlled and compartmentalized. But I'm a little loose. I'm kind of a little bit of a needy creature in a way. I need to be engaged with people. I like to say yes. I don't like to say no. Um, my last question is, okay. um, what's your next step? Like, what do you, is there like a goal you want to reach? Yeah, the organization? next step for me is as part of your growth and development in your age, there are stages in your life where you choose to, you know, sort of allow your wisdom, if you will, and your experience to serve you. So now, as I am in my sixth decade of life, I'm about you know, a larger scale of my work, which is about policy and advocacy. So that's why I'm here today. I'm here because I'm interested in being out in the world and learning about other people's vision, sharing my vision, and for us to work in a larger global picture so that we help advance the health and happiness of children. And that means meeting with government officials. That means writing, speaking, presenting. So I'm in that next step of my life, which is about advocating, fighting hard for things to be better, faster, and building my organization so that we can raise more money, do more service. We have camp programs for kids, for orphans. We have toy libraries. We have recreation and sport programs, art programs, and much more. I have an HIV clinic in Addis Ababa for 2,000 clients. I have a school in Ethiopia for 504 children. There's a lot of work to be done in the next 10 years to advance all of that, for it to grow and scale, and for it to be replicated in other places by others other than me. So hopefully, my vision becomes contagious, and other people then learn. Training is part of our organization. We train more people, then more work can be done, and more children can receive services and be independent and successful. So my destiny is laid out for me. How are we doing with questions? Last question. Oh, I didn't take anybody from above, so he gets the last question. Um, he's asking about my work as a pediatrician. Um, not in the way that you might imagine. I'm, I'm not practicing in an office setting or in, um, anymore, uh, but I'm consulting so that when people are interested perhaps in adopting a child, I still help them uh, uh, you know, uh, that with, with that journey, if you will. And, um, and then I help people who, if kids have problems with school, they're having difficulties with learning. I have an expertise in learning disabilities, ADD, ADHD, behavioral issues, so I can guide people to the right resources. So I'm doing, you know, more, if you will, more 
advanced work in my area of pediatrics, and then I teach. I teach at Cornell, Columbia, and Mount Sinai, and focus on global health. And then I mentor students who are medical students and students of public health by helping them with their research projects, and we place them in our programs abroad. So I'm really continuing the work of, of pediatrics. I do a lot of research consulting, but I'm not seeing patients. Although last week I had the pleasure of removing eight stitches from someone's face, which I really enjoyed and have had a lot of experience with in my career. So thanks for inviting me here today. Question, I have been sitting here. I need You're dying? To okay. Someone's begging me. Okay. What did you want to ask? Um, I'm curious. Like, I know you are doing a really awesome thing in the world, and I feel like uh, getting a children a home, I think that's not enough for a children. Um, I have seen quite a few documentaries about child abuse and other things. Like, do you follow up with the adult families uh, who are taking uh, taking the babies for like as an as a and how they're gonna take care of them or they're not gonna abuse them anyway? That's a good question. So he, he's asking about how we follow up with people who do adopt children. You know, the foundation. Worldwide Orphans is not engaged in adoption. We're engaged in service to orphans in five countries. But in my hat as a pediatrician helping families adopt, we certainly did follow up on families to make sure that children weren't abused. Um, <coughs> social workers are engaged with families to prevent abuse. But you know, abuse of children, neglect of children, is really pretty rampant in the world in general. And child protection, which is what you're talking about, is a very important part of aid work. Um, in fact, if you're interested in child protection, it's a lifetime of work. And many people can train. You can get degrees in child protection. And you can go to work for large organizations like UNICEF. And you can help direct, actually develop programs in different countries to provide safe spaces for kids so that they aren't abused, trafficked, and placed in child labor and all of the bad things that can happen to kids. So that's a nice question to end on because it shows that you're already identifying a priority for yourself. And I like it very much. So go do it. Okay. Have a great, great day. Today is what day of the week? Wednesday. So you still have all day today and tomorrow, and just enjoy yourself. Congratulations for already being of service. And I just wanted to just thank you so much for inviting me to be here, and I hope I come back in the future. Be well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.